Hello everyone. Welcome to the last of these little talks on physics and science. This one is actually quite a lot about biology as well, but it is the final item of our expanded view of reality that occurred in the 20th century. In the two previous talks, we've looked at, first of all, the quantum mechanics and our expansion of realization of how very, very small things behave. And then we looked at relativity and our expansion of the ways in which space and time are related to each other and energy and mass. But now we come to the final area in which our perception of the reality in which we are immersed changed very substantially over the, the 20th century. So now the big... So there we are. Um, I realise I forgot to share computer sound, so that probably didn't really work very well. But what we were looking at there was um, M31, the great galaxy in Andromeda, which is, was number 31 on a catalogue compiled by Charles Messier in 1780. Now, this was a catalogue of nebulae, strange misty patches which are visible in the night sky. And there was some debate as to what these things actually were. William Herschel, whom I've included because she's actually, he's actually a very distant ancestor of, of mourners, um, was of the view, and he was a very renowned astronomer, discovered the planet Uranus and was a, you know, a terrific telescopic observer. He, he was of the view that at any rate, some of these misty patches might actually be other island universes like our own, consisting of millions of stars. But that view was rather fell out of favor during the, 19th century, the latter half of the 19th century, but was revitalized by Edwin Hubble in about 1920 with the aid of the 100 inch, the new 100 inch telescope installed on Mount Wilson in California, which was able to resolve the stars or some of the stars in this nebula in Andromeda and reveal that it was indeed a collection of stars very far away. And what's more, some of those stars were found to be the of a type called Cepheid variables, which have a varying brightness, which varies according to a very fixed period. And it had been discovered by observing similar stars in our own galaxy that there was a nice relationship between the frequency of oscillation and the brightness of the star. Slow oscillations meant bigger stars and hence brighter. So by measuring the period of a Cepheid variable, you could determine how bright it was intrinsically, and then by seeing how dim it appeared to be on your telescope, you could work out how far away it was. And this technique was actually employed on stars in the Andromeda Nebula and showed that it therefore was actually two million light years away. And so now if, if you have a look at, um, oh, no, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to. Just play briefly with this, but um, 
now if we share screen to here hopefully you can see a google sky and a part of the night sky this square here is the square of pegasus it's about four times bigger than the pan if you like of the plow and stringing out behind it is the constellation of andromeda and there are two stars up here and just to the right of them there is a uh, with the naked eye just about visible very faint misty patch it's nothing like as bright as that you can just about see it in good conditions and if you do you are looking at light that left no less than two million years ago has been traveling all that time rather a striking thought really so that was the first thing that um, Edwin Hubble discovered. The second thing was that galaxies appeared to be travelling away from us. That could be told by observing the Doppler shift of the light from them, that it seemed to be redder than it should be, just in the same way that the note of an ambulance, if it's travelling away from you, sounds lower in pitch than if it's travelling towards you. The same could be found with light. And it was discovered, as he looked at more and more of these galaxies, that they were travelling away from us at increasing speeds. The further away they were, the faster they appeared to be traveling. The whole universe seemed to be expanding. So our perception of the universe suddenly exploded, if you like. Not only was it vastly bigger than we had previously conceived, the universe didn't consist of just the stars in our Milky Way, but thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of galaxies spread over unimaginable distances in a framework that was actually expanding furiously. The stars, the galaxies furthest away from us were moving almost at the speed of light away from us. So the universe revealed itself to be an enormous, a vast place. The, in my early childhood, there were two theories about how this expanding universe could be maintained. One of them was referred to as the, the steady state theory, which envisaged the replacement of matter in the, in the universe as it expanded. So at a very, very, very small rate, you know, one, one proton per cubic light year, but this sort of amount was calculated as being enough to generate new matter to replace what was expanding towards the edge of the universe and hence maintain an infinite, an infinitely expanding, infinitely existing, eternal universe that had always been there and always would be there. Uh, expanding and replenishing itself. That was the steady state theory. The other theory was that actually everything did start. If you, if you looked at the speed at which the galaxies were moving and the distance away they were and plotted that backwards, you found that they all seemed to arrive at the same point at about the same time at which this was assumed to be when the universe started with what was called rather contemptuously by its opponents the Big Bang. So this was the Big Bang theory. Well, in 1965 or so, a discovery was made which really proved the Big Bang Theory and it's never been disputed since. So let's just have a look at, at the guts of the Big Bang Theory. Um, this says that at 13.8 billion years ago or thereabouts, everything started, space, time, everything, and Initially, really all there was was, well, you hardly know, but light or something like it, like photons. As the universe expanded, the particles that we saw in our 
um, quantum physics little talk began to crystallize out of the expanding and cooling universe. So we have W bosons, quarks, electrons, tor mesons, these sort of things expanding or crystallizing out in a way as the universe expanded. This is still very short times, 10 to the minus 10, that's one ten billionth of a second. But as time wore on, more and more of these particles were uh, crystallized. And after about a hundred thousandth of a second, the quarks bound together to make protons and neutrons. And then those bound together to make the nuclei of hydrogen and helium atoms. And finally, after about 300,000 years, the Pro nuclei of protons and neutrons would combine together to uh, would attract electrons around them so as to become actual atoms of hydrogen and helium and sorry I'm just going to try and find the annotate button eyes, here we are, right, so you can now see. So at this point, the atoms of hydrogen and helium appeared. And when that occurred, there were no longer any free charged particles to scatter and deflect the photons of radiation. So they were now free, just loose in the universe. And the proponents of the Big Bang idea said, well, therefore, once all these neutral atoms had appeared, the remaining radiation ought never to have been absorbed, so it ought still to be there. We ought to see a sort of background radiation. Of course, because the universe has expanded so much, instead of being very short wavelength, high energy photons, it will now be low energy, long wavelength ones, perhaps in the sort of microwave region of the spectrum. And lo and behold, that was then discovered by these two people, Penzias and Wilson, who used this incredible looking bit of apparatus. They purloined it. It was built by Bell Labs in the US for a, a satellite communications application, which was already redundant by this time, 1960s. So these two were using it to look at the um, emissions from hydrogen atoms in deep space. But they've kept having trouble with this continuing background noise that they couldn't get rid of. They thought it might be emissions from New York or, or, uh, or from the earth or from pigeons, believe it or not. Or they couldn't get rid of it and eventually concluded that there was a sort of overall faint background radiation in the universe in the microwave part of the spectrum. Whereupon the Big Bang theorists said, ah, oh, well, you found it then. You found the cosmic microwave background that we predicted. So that really set the seal on the, the finished the steady state theory and established the reality of the Big Bang, that everything really did start 13.8 billion years ago. Rather interestingly, note that it's after that, what it started with was effectively light and everything else appeared later. Now, in the 19th century, when it was becoming, when free thinkers were finding it rather grand and bold to challenge the Bible and criticize it, um, one of the remarks was, well, of course, the first chapter of Genesis talks about light at the beginning, but we know that light only comes from stars and stars didn't appear until much later in the Genesis account. So it was obviously back to front and got it wrong, didn't it? But those people in the 19th century didn't know what 
we now do know that actually, actually light was around long before stars and galaxies. They didn't turn up until about a billion years after the Big Bang, when small aggregations of or local density variations in the spread of these helium and hydrogen atoms throughout the universe caused them to aggregate together under gravity and eventually aggregate to large enough amounts for the gravitational pressure to start nuclear reactions in the core and the production of heat and light and in other words the appearance of stars but that was after a billion years light was around right from the very start so the remark let there be light was actually an extremely profound way to start a creation account very remarkable but going back to this after a billion years yes stars and galaxies indeed formed as the stars aggregated together under again the force of gravity the weak force of gravity and now here we are um, 13 billion years later. The early stars, you'll notice that um, the only atoms that were created as a result of the Big Bang, sorry, were hydrogen and helium. Where did the others come from? Well, that I'm putting in the periodic table again just to wind up my daughter who listens to these and said she always got bored by the bits about the periodic table so I thought I'd bung that again just to show us that all the other elements that we now find on the earth actually emerged in earlier generations of stars. Hydrogen and helium are what you start with Hydrogen being squashed together in the center of a star will eventually create a, a, a nucleus of helium and release energy in so doing. And that's what causes the hot stars to shine. As they use up their hydrogen, further processes of stuffing helium nuclei together to make carbon. You notice it tends to be in going up in steps of four. So for he three helium nuclei can be made carbon, stuff another helium nucleus on and you get oxygen, another one you get neon. These red squares indicate the most prevalent elements in things like our sun. This process goes on, you can keep on squashing nuclei together and getting a bit more energy out until you reach iron. And that is the 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 lowest energy state, anything after that is actually you require to put energy in to make any further elements. So those all appear in catastrophic explosions called supernovae, which occur at the end of the life of very big stars. But what that meant was that in the very early populations of stars, there was really nothing except hydrogen and helium. But by the time our star appeared, um, the, there was enough other elements spread about in the universe from the death of previous stars to mean that the disks out of which the stars appeared had elements in them other than hydrogen and helium. And in other words, the sort of things that you could make planets out of. And so here we see stars with planets beginning to appear. So there we are. We have now got to the point at which, at which our Earth appeared. The Earth, a marvellous sight hanging in space. We now know that lots of other stars have planets around them. In fact, maybe I mean, there are reckoned to be a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, maybe several billion planets. So one immediately might think, well, you know, presumably, therefore, masses and masses of, of life and alien civilizations. Well, maybe or maybe not. It's actually there are quite a lot of factors involved in the generation of 
intelligent civilizations like ours. And we'll go through some of those stages. And first of all, we'll look at some of the requirements for a planet actually to produce the sort of life that we've got on ours. First of all, the star needs to be quite small, like our sun. Um, big stars burn up their fuel too quickly and so don't sit around long enough for the sort of time that it took us to evolve, which was basically four billion years. So we need a small star. We need it to have appeared comparatively late on in the universe history so that there are enough other elements around for the planetary disk to create planets like our Earth with lots of iron in the core and lots of other elements around it, not just a gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn, which is mostly hydrogen and helium. Then the planet, if it's going to produce life like ours, needs to be in a fairly narrow band of distance from its star to mean that its surface temperature is about right for liquid water, which is a fairly limited range. This is referred to as the Goldilocks zone, i.e. not too hot, not too cold, but just right. The big killer is that it not only needs to be in this Goldilocks zone, but it needs to stay in it for billions of years. Now, planetary orbits are quite difficult. And if there are lots of planets going round stars, they are likely to interact with each other and pull each other around and upset each other's orbits. And I suspect that the type of solar system that we've got with a small number of rocky planets near the sun and then a big gap and then big gas giants further out turn, will turn out to be what you need if things are going to be stable for billions of years like ours have been. I suspect the layout of our solar system isn't random. It's the sort of thing you have to have if everything's going to be nice and stable, like it needs to be for us to appear. Uh, it is also suggested that our unusually big moon is actually necessary because that keeps our rotation axis stable and that it may well not be a coincidence that we have this unusually large moon. We also need to retain our atmosphere um, and one of the th ways in which the Earth manages to keep its atmosphere is by its magnetic field which keeps the charged particles coming out of the sun away. So our the circulating iron core creates a magnetic field which shields us from the stripping effect of the what's called the solar wind. Now there seems to be some debate about this. Venus, for instance, has a thick atmosphere but doesn't seem to have a magnetic field. Um, it's obviously a different composition of atmosphere. Quite how it survives though, I'm not sure. Mars though has definitely has had all its atmosphere stripped away and this is felt to be because it doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it. There also needs to be liquid water for the sort of life that we have now experienced to arise. You need to have enough water in which the initial chemicals can swill around and stick together and form the basic building blocks of life. But if it was all water, the surface was entirely covered with water, clearly, although you might get maybe even quite quite intelligent life, you wouldn't be very easily able to launch rockets to Mars and things if everything was underwater. So ideally, liquid water over part of the surface, where the water came from, again, seems to be open to debate. It might be have emerged from the, from the, the magma in the, uh, within the Earth, um, or it might have arrived in the form of icy asteroids from the original planetary disk. In either way, in either case, the amount of water that either emerges or arrives is a pretty random event. And it could easily have been, again, too little or too much. What you want is just right. Interesting to note again that Gerald Genesis makes the point that the the waters were separated off 
uh, they were called seas and dry land appeared. Well, that is actually a significant element in the arrival of, of life as we know it on the earth. The fact that liquid water only covered part of the surface. Now we get on to the actual process of, of the development of life itself, the most extraordinary saga, and really the origins of only very putative. Um, the Earth crystallized out of its planetary disk about four and a half billion years ago, and it appears that within a billion years, some sort of primitive life had appeared. Now, the trouble is the, the basis of all the life that we now see on Earth um, is too complicated just to have arrived by itself because it's a, a number of interacting things. We have DNA, dioxyribonucleic acid, which effectively contains codes for the construction of proteins. Proteins are complicated molecules folded up on each other, made out of constituents called amino acids. The DNA comprises sort of codes for making these proteins. They, the message is transmitted from the DNA by something called messenger RNA, or ribonucleic acid, along which incredible little machines trundle, which read off bits of code at a time and stick together a corresponding chain of amino acids to make the required protein. It's the most remarkable, astonishing sequence. Um, but the thing is, there's no point in having DNA if you can't, if you haven't got, if there aren't such, you know, you can't make proteins and there's no point in having proteins or you can't have proteins really, unless you've got something to make them. So the thought is that RNA is half, is sort of halfway between the two. It does consist of this string of chemical bases which can be used to make a sort of code but it isn't stiff like DNA it can be bent into complex shapes like proteins so maybe maybe so a simple little strand of these bases was able to sort of replicate itself maybe by having attracted a small number of amino acids and constructed a little protein out of them, which acted as a sort of enzyme to help it make more of itself. Maybe it's generally felt that something like RNA was probably the first thing to have appeared in the seas on earth with their amino acids, which had been created by ultraviolet light or lightning discharges from the chemicals that were around. These little membranes can perhaps also be created spontaneously and by the interaction of, of lightning and ultraviolet with um, the liquid containing these chemicals. And if these, some of these things happen to be encapsulated in this membrane, then perhaps they would have a greater chance of completing their replication if they were sort of kept close to each other. So all very putative, but something like that may have been what started it all off. Um, and then somehow, somehow, these RNAs had the, so to speak, the idea of sticking two of them together in a sort of complementary form to make the double twisted helix of DNA, but at the same time retaining strands of RNA to act as the messengers to make proteins. I mean, it is, the whole thing is quite mind blowing, really. Somehow, another big step from something very primitive like this to the sophisticated DNA, RNA, protein scheme that underlies all our subsequent life. Somehow that occurred. 
somewhere around about here. So that's another remarkable step. A third remarkable step was the subsequent appearance of chlorophyll, which is the substance which conducts photosynthesis and makes carbohydrates and oxygen out of carbon dioxide and water. These early organisms obtained their energy to conduct these little processes by um, respiration using things like sulfur and methane. But here, the photosynthesis started releasing oxygen into the atmosphere, which had a very dramatic effect over this sort of billion year spell because it gradually changed the nature of the Earth's atmosphere, which was originally full of stuff like ammonia and methane and water vapor and so on, and carbon dioxide. As this photosynthesis got underway, the carbon dioxide was eaten up and oxygen was produced, which in turn reacted with the methane and converted it into more carbon dioxide and Hence, that could be consumed too. So gradually, all of this sort of stuff that was around at the beginning gradually faded away and the atmosphere became largely of nitrogen and oxygen as it is now, which meant that the atmosphere contained this extremely reactive element, oxygen, which meant that respiration, in other words, combining oxygen with pretty well anything, would release energy for organisms that needed it. So it suddenly meant that the environment was much, much, much more favorable for organisms to developed because they could get energy very quickly from just sucking in a bit of oxygen and letting it react with some of the carbon-based chemicals that they had got inside. But there were two other effects of this change in the atmosphere. First of all, the sun doesn't act, didn't actually remain completely static over its billions of years of existence, it's gradually hotting up, it still is in fact, which of course meant that gradually the earth would have, if you like, left the Goldilocks zone, left to its own devices. However, very conveniently, the early atmosphere, of course, has got all these what we now know call greenhouse gases in it, carbon dioxide and methane and things, which meant that it actually had a higher temperature um, than it would otherwise have had when the sun was a bit cooler. As the sun gradually got hotter and hotter, the atmosphere got less and less greenhousey, so the surface temperature of the Earth remained rather the same. Cunning stuff. And the third thing that the oxygenated atmosphere did was create an ozone layer at the top of the atmosphere, which protects against ultraviolet radiation, which is extremely, it is very energetic and destroys organic chemicals. So really life on land on a planet with no protection against ultraviolet light wouldn't really be practicable. But once oxygen had appeared and created ozone, the ultraviolet was screened enough for life on land to be practicable as well as in the sea. So the whole transformation of the atmosphere was a key event caused by the happenstance appearance of chlorophyll, which eventually gets incorporated into the cells that had appeared. And this, this changing of the atmosphere was a sufficiently important event that once again, funny old Genesis, you see, effectively records this by saying that um, after the plants appeared, then, the, it says, then the sun and moon and stars appeared. Well, you might think, well, that was silly. Of course, the sun and moon and stars were around ages before plants appeared on the earth. 
But I suggest what it's trying to say is after plants appeared on the earth, the atmosphere got so that you could see the sun and the moon and the stars, which you certainly wouldn't have been able to do through all this lot. So as they, one of the sources I found put it, the, sun, the sky turned blue uh, during the activities of this cyanobacteria. And how else do you put that to a, an Iron Age culture? Well, you say that the sun and moon and stars appeared very interesting. Another parallel freak event then occurs that one cell sort of swallows another and leads to the development of these much more complicated so-called eukaryotic cells these are more like bacteria, very simple little things. There's the DNA, which contains the genetic information. There's a membrane and there's a few other bits and pieces, but that's about it. This is the much more complicated type of cell that all complex life forms have with a nucleus, with chromosomes in it and so-called organelles, strange little things that do clever stuff, make proteins and what have you. And they also have what's known as mitochondria, which has its own DNA. You may have heard of people talking about mitochondrial DNA. And that has, produces a chemical which actually allows ordinary sort of heat energy really to emerge as electrical potential so that you could actually drive processes with this ATP chemical. So that's another very remarkable development that happened sort of in parallel and eventually got swallowed into one of these cells to lead to something like this. So what I think I'm trying to indicate is we've had we've had the appearance of some sort of self-replicating chemicals. We've then had that changing into the complicated system of DNA, RNA and proteins. We then had that leading to simple bacterial cells. We then had the appearance of chlorophyll and the changing of the atmosphere, which prevented the earth from getting too hot and kept the ozone off and produced this wonderful source of respiratory material. We then had the appearance of mitochondria or the forerunners of mitochondria and the emergence of eukaryotic cells. Then even at the primitive state, there was yet another, after another billion years, multicellular life appeared, which again is very counter, counterintuitive really, because all this time cells had been evolving to be as good as possible about resisting things that might attack them or upset them, as good as possible in acquiring nutrients and carrying out respiration with the oxygen to create energy for themselves and replicating themselves whenever they could to increase their dominance of their local environment. And in a multicellular animal, of course, individual cells are now have to sacrifice themselves to the needs of the organism. The organism needs to tell them to stop reproducing if it doesn't want them to. It might have to, might them, they might have to die if, the, if that's in the interests of the organism. So, I mean, I think effectively cancer cells are cells that are forgotten, they're part of a body and go back to being what they've spent billions of years evolving to be, i.e. efficient little things that resist attempts to wipe them out and grow as fast as they possibly can. It was a very counter, counter evolutionary step in some ways for cells to clump together to make an actual organism. But of course, once they had, and once this sort of process had started, you then were all 
able to leap off into the evolution of sort of life forms as we know it. From about one billion years ago, these sort of things appeared. And then from about 500,000, sorry, 500 million years ago, um, we get sort of um, animal life and plants appearing like we know them. Again, just interesting to note the order in which they appear. Fish we have coming first, then uh, dinosaurs, which were the antecedents of birds, and finally mammals. So just as a matter of interest, what does the order Genesis give in the way things appeared? Well, fish, birds, animals, it says. So that starts getting us to um, um, the sort of world that we're familiar with. It's interesting that over this time there were a number of big extinction events caused by major volcanic eruptions or sometimes they're not known but certainly the fossil record shows that at about 250 million years ago and 200 million years ago and about 50 million years ago something happened that wiped out most of the species and intriguingly there were but quite a sort of advanced animal life in all these phases there were wonderful things known as, is he looking up for my um, synapsids, sort of, you know, lizardy looking things were around here. They pretty much got wiped out in this extinction event, but then the sauropsids carried, well, ruled the roost over this period. They got wiped out here, and our friends, the dinosaurs, prevailed in this region and they got wiped out here. And after that, the mammals appeared. And the interesting thing is that in none of these previous attempts did anything like, you know, large brained creatures and advanced sort of civilizations appear. So one, two, three, it took the fourth attempt of a sort of animal life types on earth to get to the beginnings of us. And even that, the arrival of us on the scene, again, seemed a curiously sort of random process. The first sort of um, hominids, Australopithecus, had very tiny brains. You see, not very different from a chimpanzee at all, but they walked upright. This was the first thing that happened, whether it was due to climate change, uh, prairies as opposed to forests, don't really quite know, but Walk, walking upright was the first thing. Then we developed one of the unlikely cap uh, capabilities we have is apparently the ability to sweat, which we can do much better than most animals. And actually all this marathon running is something, is something that the human, the human is almost uniquely able to do. And although we emerge from the sort of creatures like gorillas and chimpanzees, which basically, you know, fed on sort of fruit and nuts, we were able to hunt by basically chasing after animals until they got exhausted, because nothing else can keep going as long as we can, even though antelopes and goodness knows what might be able to run faster, they have to stop after a bit because they overheat and they can't breathe well. And if they carry on too much, they'll die. But we toughed it out. So we started being able to eat more meat, which means that we didn't need to devote so much of our bodily energies to digestion, which funnily enough, when you're living on the sort of diet that these live on, it, it, digestion is a really energy consuming operation, quite apart from, of course, you have to have these enormous jaws to crunch up the dreadful stuff. But a combination of eating more meat, we allowed us to, devote more energy into this extremely energy uh, thirsty organ of the brain, which in turn led us to do things like 
discovered that if you cooked food, it was much more easy to get down. And so we needed to spend even less energy in our digestions, which meant we could even develop even bigger brains. And gradually, by this sort of rather weird route of you know, walking upright and then chasing things because we could sweat and then a sort of complementary process of easing down the effort put into digestion and building up the effort built into expanding a brain, eventually, we get to us, Homo sapiens, all rather remarkable. And that's really, the, there were two points that I wanted to draw out of this now from a sort of a, a Christian perspective. Um, the first of all is what I think you may have picked up on, the parallels between this account of the evolution of the universe and then life on earth with Genesis chapter one, which strikes me as being really the most extraordinary example of sort of inspired writing. How on earth somebody in four or 500 BC managed to come up with that when the sort of more typical creation type stories around at the time are much more like what appears in Genesis chapter two, um, the Adam and Eve story. Now, Adam and Eve, of course, has got lots of clever things to say about, you know, good and evil and so on. We, you know, that's beyond this part, but it starts with a sort of rather more typical creation narrative. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, because the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then he planted a garden in Eden, and put the man there that he'd formed. So in other words, there's no sort of time element in this. And the order of battle was, first of all, God created man and then he created gardens and then um, water started coming out of the ground. Um, sorry, no, but basically, that's a sort of more typical primitive creation view. And I rather like to sort of feel that someone somewhere in the... Jewish temple, when the scriptures were being sort of assembled, were, had this and thought, hang on, no, that, no, no, that's not how it started. No, no, that's not right. No, no, it started like this. And he comes out with this incredible account with its rhythm of time, time. It didn't all happen at once. It wasn't just then, then. It was first there was this. Then there was that. Then there was that. It took time. It took time. That's the first thing that comes out of the Genesis chapter one account. And then it has this remarkable, to me at any rate, degree of parallelism with the evolutionary account, starting with light and stressing the gathering together of water and separation from the land. And then this, the subsequent the clearing of the atmosphere after the appearance of plants and then the fish bird animal sequence i genuinely feel that if you asked a team of modern scientists and anthropologists familiar with the thought patterns of iron age man to come up with an 800 word summary of the arrival of human beings on the scene from the origins of the universe in ways that an Iron Age culture could understand, they would be hard put to come up with anything much better than Genesis chapter one. And I feel it's a sort of enormous irony that of all things of uh, almost the most obviously 
astonishingly inspired passage in the Bible, of all things, that should be the sort of focus of apparent crisis between science and religion is just incredibly ironic. And it almost seems to hang entirely on the use of the word day in the Genesis account, which, of course, it's pointed out, well, the word for day that's used is what Hebrew used to mean 24 hours. Well, that's true, but of course we use the word day that means 24 hours in lots of other ways, as in, in my day, children obeyed their parents or something, or um, cassette players have had their day. Well, neither of those mean 24 hours. It means a time. And as I say, taking day to mean period of time or time, Genesis chapter one is quite the most remarkable uh, summary of the process that I've just spent, you know, three quarters of an hour grinding through, I think, anyway. So that's one point I wanted to make. And the other is the the issue that parts of the New Testament certainly do rather suggest that, you know, Jesus, the son of God, God entering his universe, this was the place in which this astonishing event of God entering his own universe in some, some extraordinary physical way, it was in the human race and in the form of Jesus Christ that this incredible event occurred and that has implications for the whole universe is what St Paul applies, implies in Romans chapter 8 um, where he says that um, creation was, the whole creation waits for the revealing of the children of God um, creation it is groaning in, 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 in expectation that it will be set free from the, its bondage to, to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So there's a sort of sense in which the incarnation, as believed in, in Christianity, the appearance of God somehow in very self, in physical universe in the form of Christ is of a sort of cosmic nature and now you might be inclined to say well surely that can't be right now that I mean it might have been all right for St Paul with his limited universe but we of course know that with all these hundreds of billions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies there must be all number of other places in which that could occur well maybe but maybe not I think what one realizes is that the appearance of us is actually not just the product of one miraculous thing, near, namely the appearance of life, but actually a whole string of individually incredibly unlikely events. First of all, even just the existence of a planet in a stable orbit um, with some sort of atmosphere that copes with the changing output from the sun, such as to keep it in this ideal temperature zone for billions of years. That's actually, I suspect, very, very unlikely. And then within that one needs to have somehow the appearance of some sort of self-replicating chemicals, which took a billion years, it's obviously a pretty unlikely event that this should just happen by repeated amino acid joinings and separations and flashes of lightning and ultraviolet and all the rest of it. But then after that, sorry, I clicked it right mistake. After that, there's then the sort of step to DNA or something much more complicated, which able to translate really detailed codes into proteins. That's another extraordinary step. So the, if you like, there must be billions of places in the universe where this sort of thing is around, but 
it never got any further. Either it just didn't happen randomly to happen, or else by the but the, the sun by this stage had warmed up too much and the atmosphere had got too hot and the water boiled away, and that was the end of it. Equally, the but some of them, and there must be again a very large number of places in which the step was taken of a more complicated DNA-like complex code bearing basis of life occurred because it can't be the case that the only place at which that happened was also the only place where we happened to get chlorophyll and we happened to get mitochondria and we happened to have multicellular animals. I mean, there must be millions of DNA type complicated things that haven't gone anywhere. And out of those, some must have maybe got to the extent of, of managing to produce an oxygen-based atmosphere or something to stabilize the atmosphere and allow uh, an efficient form of respiration to occur. And so there might be quite a lot of those with this cyanide bacteria around, but not these complicated cells which involved yet another freak event in the form of the appearance of something that became mitochondria. And then there must be quite a few spaces throughout the universe where there are these, but they never learned how to go back on themselves and be prepared to die at the command of the organism and create multicellular creatures. And finally, of course, as we know, even on Earth, it took four attempts to get to a type of animal that had the consciousness that we've got these, 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 and then eventually here. So, and then even to arrive at us was a sort of weird, random dodging of our, you know, which could easily not have happened. So there might be, there presumably are, a very large number of planets that have got some sort of, of animal life, which have never got any further than that. And so I feel it is not at all unreasonable, really, to think that actually, despite the enormous number of galaxies and stars within them, the number of places where we have actually actually had both, we've had primitive self-replicating chemicals and chlorophyll and the clearing of atmosphere and the development of DNA and proteins and RNA system and mitochondria and eukaryotic cells and multicellular organisms and animals, and finally, us. Each of those steps is so improbable that it is quite reasonable that to think that perhaps the only place in the entire universe where it's all actually happened and produced something like us is us. Maybe there isn't anything else there that has thought about quantum physics and right and wrong and caring about extinction and things like that. Maybe, we can't know of course, but I don't think it's naive pre-scientific to consider that maybe we are alone. It's rather sad, but I have a feeling it's quite conceivable that we are it. <laughs>